family mode. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, this is Jim Feifenberger up in Seward, Alaska, and I'm happy to welcome you to another one of our Pacific Ocean Education Team webinars. Today's webinar is going to feature Dr. John Kenish uh, from the University of Alaska Anchorage. He'll be speaking on plastic debris as a source of contaminants in the Alaska marine environment. But before we get started with that webinar, I want to just say a few things. Um, First of all, the Pacific Ocean Education Team, or POET, is an interdisciplinary team of National Park Service staff from both the Pacific West and Alaska regions. This team was established in 2008 to enhance communication education and interpretive ocean stewardship efforts in the Pacific West and Alaska regions. We have a number of stated goals, including, <coughs> excuse me, including planning and scheduling ocean stewardship education sessions through trainings, workshops, and webinars and other distance learning presentations, and hence this uh, bi-monthly webinar series as part of our efforts. Past topics in this series have included things like the benefits of marine protected areas, the vulnerability of coastlines to sea level rise, uh, the current population trends and endangered stellar sea lions, the status of the tsunami debris. We try to cover a wide gamut of uh, subjects related to uh, marine education. Recordings of those past webinars can be found on the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center's website at www.oceanalaska.org. That's www.oceanalaska.org. I'd like to also acknowledge Bonnie Phillips of Cabrillo National Monument and Sarah Allen from the Pacific West Regional Office for their help in coordinating this webinar series. And finally, uh, thanks to Yvonne Menard, who is the chair of our Pacific Ocean Education team and helps keep the team uh, moving forward with uh, good ocean education. Our next webinar uh, is scheduled for September 20th, and it will feature Daniel Muse of the U.S. Geological Survey. He'll be giving a talk entitled, Past Interglacial Sea Levels, Lessons for the Future. So some sea level rise information there should be a good one. But uh, the subject at hand today is plastic debris. We'll get to that in just another second here. First, I want to pass uh, the mic to John Morris, and he'll give us a brief a technical uh, introduction to the webinar interface. John? Thanks, Jim. Yeah. If anyone who's new to the webinar series, uh, it's very easy to operate here. Because of the number of participants online, uh, we are asking folks to make questions and comments using the chat box at the bottom of your control panel. You can just type in the message and send it to us. And you can also monitor that question box throughout the session in case there are comments or questions that we post there. Uh, that's the best way to interact with us. Uh, it's possible sometimes to open up the mics for follow-up question, but with a large number of people online, it's uh, typically a prob cause, causes problems for audio. Uh, so just so you know that, we are also recording today's session, so uh, feel free to uh, look for the archive, as Jim mentioned. So questions, comments, any technical issues, just send them in the chat, chat box, and I'll respond. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you, John. And we will uh, have a question answer period at the end of the webinar. And like John said, you can type those into that question. Uh, box or the chat box. I think the question box will work for that. And we'll, uh, I'll read the questions out loud so that everyone can hear them. And then uh, Dr. Kenish will answer those at the end. So we are very excited to have with us today Dr. John Kenish. He's from the chemistry department at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him um, to uh, deliver today's webinar. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. I'm glad uh, to have you present for this presentation and uh, we'll appreciate any and all questions that you have. Uh, the topic today is really uh, an area of interest of mine that's kind of come on lately in the last three or four years and that is the question of plastic debris and what impact it has uh, on the marine environment. Personally I'm really interested in the marine environment for obvious reasons as you can see here I spend a lot of time, a lot of my free time I'm fishing and occasionally it has some success and I'm real concerned about the quality of the environment at large with regards to uh, impacts from contaminants. So uh, one of the uh, things I've shown here is an artistic pr uh, presentation related to this question of what's really under the water. Uh, this is an image showing uh, someone looking under the water column to recognize that there's plastics contained there. But I think what's really a little bit overwhelming about this problem of uh, plastics in the environment is 
the fact that, that the distribution of plastic particles is uh, quite uh, quite broad, going from large partic large items that are floating that can be collected to very small particle size down to the nanometer uh, size in, uh, in the environment. So what we really need to realize is that uh, plastics, once they get into the environment, degrade or sometimes they're actually put into the environment in small particle size, which means that we have a large surface area of plastic material present in the oceans and those, that uh, surface area is a uh, source of potential contaminant both in terms of the materials that they're composed of as well as contaminants that are absorbed or absorbed into the plastic uh, debris itself. So from that perspective, we want to talk about some of these things. And I thought we could take a look at some of uh, what we have seen here in Alaska. Some of these areas are very remote, quite beautiful, but yet when you actually start looking into the environment, you'll notice a significant amount of debris present in the, in the system. And of course, we all know a lot about the concern with the present state of affairs with regards to the Japanese tsunami and the ever-increasing amount of debris resulting from that. that already it's uh, hit our beaches in terms of styrofoam and some other large containers, but the reality of it is uh, there's probably a lot more of this material to come in the future. And uh, the question really that is out there now is how do we deal with this? But this shows you some of the things that are present in the uh, Elizabeth Island, there's a lake there which is in a high energy zone. You can see uh, some of the debris actually concentrating on the beaches. And you can see it's a wealth of different kinds of materials. And then in the lake itself, these are particles that were observed uh, present in the lake. A whole set of things from styrofoam to plastic beads and so on that have been uh, observable and that one can pick up with their hands and see. Uh, and in, in addition to that, the question is, what about the things that are below these particle sizes that are visual? Well, we get some idea that they're there by virtue of looking at this kind of an image here showing where they've consolidated together to form a film on the surface of the lake. And so the question is, what other things are there that are hidden uh, from this debris that we really need to know something about in order to figure out what the impacts are in, uh, on the marine ecosystem and some of the species that are present in the marine ecosystem itself? Well, from the point of view of marine debris, uh, it's a huge, huge impact. It's hard to believe how big it is. And uh, it's really kind of astounding that we haven't really addressed this issue in a significant way. Although at this point, it looks like it's a world-class issue, and it's going to require a worldwide view in terms of how to resolve it. Uh, a lot of it has to do, I think, with reducing the amount of, of uh, plastics that are released in the environment. Recycling would probably be the first thing that should be attempted to do in a serious way, but when you look at images like you see here uh, from other parts of the world, it, you can see that it's an overwhelming situation. So plastics account, uh, of the marine debris that's out there, plastics actually account for something like 60 to 80 percent. Actually, the numbers that you see are bantered back, are, are banter back and forth, are really not quite uh, reliable because there's such a uh, huge amount of material and no one really has an absolute uh, idea of the, of the values of these numbers in terms of total mass and and uh, how much of the material is absolutely plastic and how they're distributed in terms of particle size. To be quite honest, there's a lot of uh, a lot needs to be done to detail what the uh, actual contamination level is like, uh, both in terms of amount and size of particles distributed throughout the world's oceans. But here's just an idea of what you might see. So this is the plastic. A report from the plastic European market showing world plastic production from 1950 to 2010, and it shows that it's increased exponentially pretty much the way most things have to do with the, in the world of technology. So there's 250,000 uh, uh, million tons of material by the time you get to a current, stat current time. But the reality of it is this material has been building up in the oceans as well. So uh, large, and that, that's the other thing. Producing is one thing. How much of it gets released into the environment is not uh, clearly known. What percentage of it is actually distributed, for example, as a result of people just disposing of it. So there's a whole array of questions that really probably need to be evaluated. So plastic production clearly has been steadily increasing, as you can see from that European image there. And uh, I think that's pretty much understood and known. The, the advantages of plastics make it a very desirable product. And so as a result of that, 
it's uh, becoming uh, increasingly disposed of on a, without any real consideration of where it's going. And, and the net result of it is that the desirability of what makes plastics so usable also ha make it an environmental hazard as well. So we have to look at this uh, products that we produce have to be considered in terms of what they're made of and what kind of effects they will have on a, uh, in, the, in the environment once they get out there. So we, I think one of the things we also have to do on an international level is think about what it is we're doing in terms of modern technology and how when we release things in the marketplace, are they really, have they really been considered in terms of their uh, long-term impact and what effects they would have on ecological systems. But anyway, plastics are durable. That means they're long-lasting. They're buoyant, which allows for the global uh, transport. Uh, much of what has entered the oceans remain unmineralized, and then microplastics exist as well as, uh, excuse me, macroplastics as well as microplastics. Microplastics is the last level at which people have kind of talked about in terms of size, but in reality, we also have nanoplastics uh, being released in the environment as well, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So my, macroplastics have been typically described as greater than five millimeters in size, microplastics below five millimeters, and of course nanoplastics is clearly uh, a different issue in terms of particle size, it's yeah, much smaller. Anyway, microplastics, that is that are greater, macroplastics rather, that are greater than five millimeters, there's uh, documentation of 267 species worldwide that have been shown to ingest or become entangled by these materials. Ingestion of micro, macroplastics by seabirds has been shown to reduce their fitness. Uh, smothering by sunken plastic debris is another problem. And then, of course, transport systems uh, for invasive species are yet another uh, concern. But here's an image that everyone who's concerned about the marine environment has probably seen in, uh, from personal experience. If you go out and you go along the beaches these days, invariably you'll find some marine birds that have been impacted by these plastic particles. Eventually what happens is they essentially die from lack of ability to assimilate their nutrients for uh, uh, during feeding. And it turns out that, interestingly enough, this is just an image of a bird, which is a observable thing for us. But if you actually were to look at marine, other marine organisms, one of the most surprising ones is to see uh, things like uh, krill impacted by, by particles that are much smaller in size. Size, of course, uh, similar to the food particles that they typically would eat. And so when you see this, you realize this is a really comprehensive problem. It's go, it, 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 go, it includes a lot of species uh, with very specific uh, feeding habits, just, uh, and, and therefore a certain species are going to be more impacted than others in terms of the particle size. And then the other question is, uh, what about the chemical nature of these materials and those things that uh, interact in terms of the uh, chemical nature of the plastics with other contaminants in the environment? How does that uh, all come into play as well. Very, very little has been done in that latter area. But microplastics now less than five millimeters, this is a picture showing some people that have collected these things uh, out of uh, Tacoma where they have uh, some kind of a, some sort of a research program looking at contaminants and they, they've developed some, been involved in a workshop where they've de helped to develop some methods for identifying how much of this plastic is actually integrated into the sea. Uh, so one goes out, collects samples, and then tries to figure out how much of it is actually plastic that's trapped in whatever's collected. So anyway, this is only relatively recent, about the last few, three or four years have people started to look at this. Uh, certainly there are critical threats here uh, through the uh, effect of contaminants in, uh, that might be present in the marine uh, biological systems. And so we have uh, basically, one, if, if you're working any kind of analytical science, for example, you do chromatography, one of the things that we all know is the smaller the particles that you use to absorb onto, uh, uh, absorb chemicals on and then release them by using uh, different solvents, you know that these compounds tend to go into plastic matrices and this is kind of going on in the marine environment all the time as well. In addition to that, the size of these small particle sizes give you a much larger surface area for these processes to occur. Uh, so the question that exists at, right off the bat is, gee, how much of the stuff is out there? Uh, how, how is it distributed throughout the planet? 
is it, uh, and, and in our case in Alaska, you know, how much of it is uh, exists in the Alaska environment and the ecosystems that reside here in Alaska? And I don't think there's any information available to us on that. So from the marine debris perspective, uh, one typically will isolate seawater or beach sand. It depends upon what, uh, of course, we could also do this probably with biological systems as well and, and actually get an idea of how much is present. So there have been some attempts to do this. So one does coarse filtration to remove uh, micro, litter, uh, micro litter, and then from there, filtrations with uh, different methods have been used to then isolate uh, particle sizes and, and to perform some kind of analysis on those. Some of those involve spectroscopy, some involve uh, fluorescence techniques, and then eventually when you get down to nanoplastic sizes, you really have to go to something like electron microscopy to detail what's present. Now, the problem with these methods is they're pretty uh, time-consuming and challenging uh, because we have a lot of biological material that has to be removed in order to get to the point where the, uh, the plastics themselves are exposed and can be evaluated in terms of, of uh, content, size, and uh, composition. So uh, microplastics originate from two main sources, uh, primary production particles. Uh, so for example, those of you who use any kind of specialized detergents or uh, facial uh, creams or things like that, nanoparticles are actually now used as suspension agents in these, or in these materials. And so we now produce products that are already at the nanometer size. And then they, of course, go through our septic systems or, uh, and then into the uh, uh, sewage treatment plant and then out into the environment. So we actually are now introducing these particles directly in terms of uh, the very small sizes. Facial cleansers, scrubs, exfoliants, plastic media are used, uh, uh, that are also used in air blasting are part of the problem here. Uh, they are suitable size for ingestion by marine organisms without further degradation. As I mentioned, the krill can be impacted by, by particles of that size. Weathered breakdown of microplastics uh, also occurs, and this occurs from photo degradation from sunlight from mechanical action in the sea, and also from mi microbiological action. Some of these things have been observed in some of the larger uh, gyres where there's been essentially huge, vast uh, collections of plastic out in the high sea. And people have been looking at uh, what is really going on in terms of this uh, photo degradation, mechanical action, and, and microbiological activity. Uh, so those are relatively, I don't know how, how long this has been going on, but uh, some of the workshops I've gone to, uh, so people have actually presented some information on trying to characterize this process. But with, with plastics, it's very slow. Microplastics, uh, the, it turns out that we have a deployment study uh, with regards to environment from a perspective of environmental hazards. Uh, one of the things is what happens to these plastics uh, when they're out there in the environment? Well, one of the things is that there is a concentration of hydrophobic contaminants from seawater, ten, a factor of 10 to the 6 is what's observed here. This has been done some, by some research studies in Japan. Uh, the fragments found in the oceans contain relatively high levels of persistent organic pollutants. We're all familiar with that. And also aliphatic hydrocarbons. So plastics, we use those, of course, even in uh, analytical work for isolating materials and also for chromatography. So this is not surprising that these compounds would be adsorbed or absorbed into the actual uh, or plastic material. So we actually kind of see that already. Uh, so these contaminants then, and in fact, I think there, there was a period where people actually used plastic films to try to figure out how much contamination there was in the aquatic environment. Problem with those processes is that they're, they're dynamic. So if you put a piece of plastic into the water, they absorb or absorb compounds, and then you can measure the concentrations at any given instant, but they change because there's uptake and release of these materials with time. And of course, if this is true, then that means it's also true when uh, organisms, uh, uh, marine organi uh, organisms uh, digest these things or take them in their bodies and then uh, release them. There's going to be some kind of a contamination transfer, uh, and not much is known about that either. When you start talking about biological fluids, then uh, it's, it can be considerably different than what you see with just seawater alone. But we have seen some experiments that have shown some relationship to impacts, and one of those is with uh, great shear waters where 
there's been positive correlation observed between the ingested plastics and the PCBs in these organisms. So there have been some reports that uh, this is uh, uh, that, that there is an impact there in, in the, in the uh, ecology of the of the marine organisms. So only one paper though has reported the release of sorb compounds after ingestion. So this is a question that needs to be really detailed. There needs to be a lot more work to try to figure out what's going on there. And that is how severe is the uh, impact of organic contaminants with regards to with uh, digestion or not a digestion but ingestion of uh, plastic material. I'm sure there's an impact. But I think it's probably different with uh, different organisms, and it's also related to their uh, body chemistry. So a simple digestion solution of surfactants and seawater was used in uh, the one study that we re that we have observed here, and sorption and desorption vary between the types of plastics and the presence of surfactants cause a 20-fold increase in desorption rate and an increase in equilibrium concentration. So from a chemical perspective, the medium that's that's uh, associated with the uh, with the plastics and what they contain is really critical in terms of understanding what's going on in different types of organisms, for example. So microplastics, uh, through much of the research to date, suggest that microplastics pose a, a risk of acting as a source of contaminants uh, to the marine organisms. There's still debate over its over its significance. However, uh, this research that uh, we're interested in really seeks to better understand the transfer mechanism of organic contaminants through the use of uh, artificial seawater. And we're also interested in looking at uh, digestive fluids. We are using uh, simulated digestive fluids. Uh, these are materials that have been created in the biomedical uh, realm because uh, it allows you to do studies without actually impacting any organisms. The real problem with uh, the problem, I guess one would consider a problem at some levels, that is that using real organisms to study uh, the effects of chemicals uh, is a bit difficult and it's better to use uh, simulated systems to get an idea of what might be occurring. So here's an example of financing being simulated by a fish, it gets into the fish and then what happens when it's in the fish. The, here, the, this sphere here represents a particle containing this compound. The question is, does the compound really allow for transfer? Does the plastic actually allow for transfer once it's in the fish because of the fish's digestive fluids? And those are questions that we really would like to know the answer to. So let's talk about some of the things that we have seen. Only a few cases here of plastics, styrofoam, fishing uh, floats, and then some plastic bottles. And some of the things that we saw, just, uh, just a few quick looks at. Uh, the things using GCMS, we see styrene present in, in the uh, plastic, in the, in the styrofoam. We see aliphatic hydrocarbons in floats, and we saw phthalates present in some of these plastic containers. So these peaks are highlighted here in terms of the specific compounds. But you notice that there's many other compounds present, and uh, not all these compounds are recognized or even characterized by modern techniques. So we know, though, that there's many different compounds then that are there in these in these pieces of uh, material that are floating around in the environment. So these pieces of plastic actually were collected off of Gore Point, which is way out in the uh, end of the Kenai Peninsula. Pretty pristine area, as it turns out, but not as pristine as we think once you realize when we actually take a look at all the plastic debris that's out there. So what is the study design that we opted to look at? Because uh, there's all kinds of questions. I mean. Uh, we got involved in this for uh, a reason that was kind of somewhat unique, I guess. Uh, there are lots of people who are out there actually collecting marine debris, and they go out each year, collect it, and then uh, dispose of it. It's a big problem because of the massive amount that the, that's present, even in terms of dealing with the regards to where do you put all this stuff. And then the other question that comes up is, gee, is this material contaminated with other materials besides the plastics themselves? Well, one of the people who's involved with that uh, who works out out of uh, uh, Anchorage here and goes out and collects this debris out off of uh, places like Gore Point, uh, asked me that question. And so we got involved in looking at this question of toxicity. Well, there's a couple things that came to mind right off the bat. One of them, of course, was the question of, and the people have already looked at this, so that is that contaminants are absorbed by these plastics. The other one is, though, that I realized that plastics also contain materials that make them flexible, which are called phthalates, and they also can be released in the environment. 
And of course, as you should be aware, uh, a lot of these plastic, uh, these phthalates, for example, have a negative impact biologically because they impact the endocrine system. And it's been shown that in uh, infants, for example, bisphenol A is a big uh, contributor to that problem. But phthalates at large also have an impact on the endocrine system. So we know now that these chemicals that are in the plastics themselves are also a contributor to toxicity. Uh, the question is, what is the impact of, the, of that toxicity in the marine uh, organisms? We don't know the answer to that, really, because most of the studies to date have been done in animal studies related to biomedical concerns. So anyway, our interest was to provide some basic knowledge for evaluating the toxicity of plastics in marine wildlife. And there are two ways that we wanted to look at that. One was to evaluate the absorption and desorption of toxic substances from the marine debris and identifying the exposure to additives present in the plastics after ingestion by marine organisms. So those are the two things that we were looking at. Of course, the other one in light of this is, gee, how much of this, uh, what kind of uh, level of contamination is there just from the plastics themselves? And that was uh, one of the things we wanted to look at. We looked at a whole array of different organisms at that level. So we'll talk about that as well. So the connection between plastic debris ingestion and toxic compound levels in marine organisms really hasn't been significantly evaluated. Uh, it's, there's only a few people globally who have looked at this question. Uh, Japanese have probably done the best work on that so far. Uh, it's controlled in in vitro experiments. Uh, con uh, controlled in vitro experiments, rather, are being used to evaluate the dissolution equilibrium and the kinetics of the toxic substances absorbed or and bound in plastic debris. That's what we're working on as one part of our study. The other is uh, we're uh, also, uh, we haven't quite done these experiments yet. We're on the way to do this, which is to actually look at leaching of the absorbed and desorbed, uh, using adsorption and desorption experiments using solutions that mimic the, the digestive system of marine organisms, because we'd like to know how big of a change do we see in uptake or release of these uh, compounds when we have digestive uh, systems of, uh, available to us? So the mimic; these are mimicking the system. They're not the absolutely the absolute digestive system of the organisms, but it's a universal model that comes out of biomedical research. So for our our, our actual absorption and desorption study, we put together a system where we're using flow through. Uh, we have a couple of pumps that pump. Uh, seawater through uh, a column. The column can be chilled in this case uh, if because we wanted to be able to do this uh, in a, a set of conditions that are similar to what we'd see in Alaska water. So we can typically ch chill these uh, samples down to about 10 degrees centigrade, which is, uh, it turns out most of the research has been done in this area of absorption and desorption of contaminants into plastics have been done at room temperature. We wanted to try to do it at a condition that was more similar to what you see in the environment. And then we can, uh, we had to use Teflon tubing and special pumps to control the flow because we're looking at chemicals that adsorb into plastics <laughs> at large. And most of the times these pumps are, contain plastics themselves that are used to uh, distribute the fluid. So we had to go to uh, using Teflon and uh, we pumped these uh, fluids and the artificial sea were containing uh, a, a, a compound of concern. Uh, right now we've been doing it mainly with uh, PAHs and it's been flowing through the column then into a fluorescence instrument where we can uh, detect the levels of, uh, of the compounds in terms of the uh, fluorescent response. So that's, uh, it's, it's kind of nice because we can do this on the flow, although we are doing batch methods to track, uh, to actually, uh, continue, uh, to basically, uh, um, whoops, to basically reproduce the similar results by what most people have done, which is batch method. We wanted to do it with a newer technique that's faster uh, and will still give the meaningful results. So our samples basically, uh, as we work with it now, are plastics. We're using a PVC and MDPE, for example, uh, surface areas uh, is what we're looking at using Brunauer and Emmett Teller mathematical models. And then we're using artificial seawater as our actual medium for uh, the start of, the, of this study. Uh, and then we're going to use simulated gastric juices uh, to look at how this might be uh, affected by uh, organisms in the, in the exposure state. And then uh, 
we want to uh, simulate intestinal fluids uh, that are present in the organism. So we have two different levels. There's gastric fluids, and then there's also fluids that occur later, lower in the intestinal tract. So the batch method, uh, this is uh, my graduate student, Ben Applegate, who's working on his master's degree through the environmental engineering program. And he's uh, uh, actually the one who has set up and uh, working uh, the absorption study using the flow through as well as batch methods. And so here we're using 10 milligrams of plastic in 25 milliliters of financially fortified uh, artificial seawater, which is at 2.5 to 10 nanograms per milliliter of phenanthrene. Uh, in the continuous flow, uh, use it, uh, this is a continuous horizontal rotary shaker rather at 200, part, 200 uh, revolutions per minute, 10 degrees centigrade. So we're working around this 10 degrees, which is maybe even a little higher than what you find in the marine environment in Alaska, but it's pretty close. And so phenanthrene, as we said here, is measured periodically using fluorescence as our detection method. In the column method, this is showing the columns. There's just nothing more than stainless steel tubes packed with these plastic materials. And then uh, here we have upper flow from anthony fortified in seawater. Through the column, we have half a mil to one mil a minute flow rate at 10 degrees centigrade. And once in equilibrium is detected, uh, has been reached rather, we feed the solution uh, as changed to pure seawater to, to uh, desorb the material. So we can do both the uh, adsorption and desorption uh, and the continuous flow process, which makes it kind of nice. Sal flow collected at time intervals and financing concentration determined by fluorescence. And uh, so uh, in the column method in desorption, we use the same apparatus as the column method for absorption. Column loaded with plastics, previously loaded with phenanthrene. Uh, this solution media will be pumped through the column using these different media. And then outflow will collect at time intervals and phenanthrene concentration determined by fluorescence. So all of this is detected by fluorescence, which is pretty sensitive for pH uh, measurements. So what are the implications of all this? Well, the implications is that we would like to have a better understanding of the absorption mechanism that's at work here, uh, that would, and something that's similar to or close to what might be happening in the, in the environment itself. So we want to provide some basic knowledge to evaluate the toxicity of plastics uh, to marine wildlife. Uh, we, and this we do by using these simulated digestive uh, fluids. And that the question then is, does this increase the rate of release of these compounds into the organism? And then we want to add recirculation pumps to simulate uh, less than 100% uptake of compounds of interest and use the system to evaluate sorption, desorption of other compounds of interest. So this is kind of just an early start to what we hope to accomplish. This is some early data showing the uh, percent breakthrough for the column and then how the column uh, looks in terms of uptake and then uh, release of the, of the, th of the uh, phenanthrene here. And then the actual uh, uh, mathematical model that would be the uh, <laughs> for now for right now it escapes me but I think it's a Langmuir isotherm that we're looking at here in the upper part of this uh, image right here this would be the mathematical result of this output of this experiment so from this we can predict the binding and release of these materials from uh, these these this particular uh, matrix here this is PVC in this particular instance. Okay, now the question then is, uh, the next question then is, uh, what's the, what is the issue with regards to, to contamination or potential contamination in Alaska? And one of the things is we have several things going on. One is we have this huge Pacific gyre here, and then we also have a Gulf of Alaska gyre, which is what's drive these compounds, uh, these materials rather, up into Alaska. This is why we see a lot of these uh, plastic debris items destroyed distributed all through uh, the coast of Alaska. So this, uh, so the, the flow of the gyre actually is in this direction on the Pacific level. On the Gulf of Alaska, it flows in the opposite direction. Of course, this was all clearly learned by the oil spill, for example, where people were, were surprised at the beginning to find out that Kodiak Island, for example, which is over here, was impacted by oil from Valdez. And that's because the, of the counter flow of this uh, Gulf of Alaska gyre. So the question then is, what, what about these contaminations and plastic material? And you know, are we what kind of impact might we 
expect just because of the physiology of the oceans themselves. And uh, so then that leads, that leads to the question of, well, okay, we got all these phthalates but potentially out there. What are these phthalates coming from? Well, all this plastic material that you see displayed here are potential source of phthalates because they're part of the matrix that, uh, part of the construction of these materials and part of the construction related to what makes them flexible. Uh, of course, you're all familiar with these models with regards to children's exposure, which uh, I think has now finally been banned at its bisphenol A. Uh, but there are other phthalates in there, and those phthalates also have some physiological impact uh, as well. So what are those impacts? Well, proposed toxicity, and this comes from mainly uh, research studies in the, uh, in the uh, met biomedical field, and some of these things have been observed. Some of them are suggested, so please don't take these as absolutes. But there has been evidence showing that they are hormone disruptors. They do uh, bind to proteins in the endocrine system, which then trigger uh, a, a change in the genetic codes, which then change the protein uh, production inside of the cell. Uh, there's also potential uh, for uh, genetic, uh, genital defects. Breast and prostate cancer have been suggested related to this, and then brain alterations during development. And then there's some suggestion that it could also be related to the problem of obesity and diabetes. So those are, uh, these are all points of concern that come out of biomedical studies. Um, are they occurring in the natural ecological system of the, of the marine environment? That's not clear. Uh, and I don't know of any real studies that have been done with living organisms from the marine environment per se. So assessing levels of six phthalates are what we ended up doing here was to look at these phthalates in particular because they're the common ones that are known to be used in manufacture of plastics. So we took the uh, st a standard uh, of the we took a whole array of these standards and also deuterated forms of these to actually do some analysis of contamination in the marine environment of Alaska. So we took different trophic levels. Uh, now I'm not a biologist, so I'm not going to say that I have these trophic levels defined clearly, but we looked at clams, halibut, uh, coho salmon, and tufted puffins, uh, and looked at the concentrations of these uh, phthalates present in those particular organisms uh, from uh, different parts of Alaska. The clams came from the Kenai Peninsula mainly in the uh, Niltik or, and also those were razor clams and then we took some clams from uh, Ho uh, Homer which were butter clams. So those are two different species. One is a filter feeder and one is an actual feeder that collects its food by passing through the sediment. And then halibut of course is a bottom feeder. Coho salmon is a, uh, I don't know, coho salmon I guess is a, I don't know what level of predator it would be in the marine environment, but it's getting up there. And then tufted puffins, of course, are marine birds, which are uh, consuming all types of different uh, fish species. Um, and as a result of that, would be uh, impacted by whatever is present in that food source. Of course, that's true of the halibut and coho salmon as well. The other thing I should mention about this is this, that is that clams are known to be free of uh, uh, things like cytochrome P450, they don't seem to metabolize chemicals that they're exposed to. So for example, uh, in the past, uh, in some of the studies related to oil spill contamination, people have used mussels for that reason because it shows a level of contamination without uh, any significant change in the distribution of the compounds because they're not uh, metabolized by these organisms, at least that's the theory. Halibut, coho, salmon, and tufted puffins all would be metabolized. They all have cytochrome P450 at some level. And so these organisms would see a different uh, presence of these compounds. They also might have uh, some, uh, some of the metabolites of these particular six uh, phthalates as well. However, we did not monitor for these metabolites. So that's a whole other area of study that would need to be evaluated as well. That is, what are the metabolites and at what level do the metabolites exist in these systems? So the state-of-the-art instrumentation that we used here, which you can't really see per se, but that's this box back here, 
Uh, this is my under, uh, an undergraduate student who did the uh, analysis of these materials, actually. She not only uh, did the analysis, but she also had to set up the method and basically figure out how to reduce the level of contamination that's present in the laboratory so that we got down to something like a half a part per billion uh, uh, method level so that we could actually measure these concentrations at levels that are higher than that. And so she did a bang up job there. And as you know, th uh, plastics are everywhere now, so, and so are the phthalates that uh, are present in those. So it was a real challenge, but she did a really bang up job. So this is Shereen Ali. She's, uh, I think she's going to go to Australia now. She wants to go someplace warm. <laughs> Alaska is not, it's cold, and so sometimes it's pleasant to have a nice experience of going to, you can see from this picture here, this is the middle of the winter when a lot of this work was done, so it doesn't look very pretty here. But anyway, analysis by, was done by LC uh, MSMS, which is state of the art. So that's this instrument here with LC triple quad mass spec. This is also an LCMS, which is an ion trap, which is nice for discrimination, but this is really good for low level detection. And we were using a atmospheric uh, pressure photo ionization uh, ionizer at the at the introduction of the of the mass spectrometer that's right in here. Uh, that seemed to give us the best sensitivity with regards to the compounds we were interested in. So the output of the um, instrument, I guess I'm hitting the wrong button here, sorry. So uh, the actual output of the chromatogram looks like this. So we run this through a uh, LC column and we can isolate these uh, phthalates from one another pretty clean. In addition to that, with the mass spectrometer, there's uh, we also get the actual specific ions, both the, those that are used for detection and those that are used for absolute uh, determination or, uh, of the representative compound. So this is a pretty powerful tool. We, you know, it's kind of like the issue of trying to catch people who are using uh, drugs illegally uh, in athletics, for example. This kind of equipment is pretty powerful for that tool because you can detect and quantitate and you can also uh, absolutely can uh, uh, confirm the presence of the compound. So it's a pretty spiffy method for uh, doing analytical determination of these materials. So one of the things that we ran into is that everything that we used had some kind of contamination with regards to plastics. So we had to do a lot of cleanup uh, and also uh, set up a method so that we would get our detection limits down. And this gives you a rough idea of what the detection limits are like so for several of the different uh, phthalates. Uh, so you can see there, it, it's not absolutely the same for all. The levels of, of, uh, me of the method detection depend upon how uh, contaminated the reagents and the equipment are. So we uh, got it down to a reasonable level for most of them. Some, some are higher than others. Uh, and then as a result of that, we, we're, we got down low enough that we could determine uh, significant levels within the marine species. So this gives you an idea. Here's an example of reproducibility of the method. This is DEHP and clams. So the average here is 5.5 parts per billion with plus or minus 5%. And we did four replicate determination here just to give you an idea of uh, the actual sensitivity here. Uh, and then, of course, this is the average concentration of phthalates of interest for Alaska species, clams, halibut, coho, salmon, tufted puffins. And you can see the rough concentration of parts per billion versus the compound uh, that, uh, I mean, the actual compound we're looking at. So you can see that, um, first of all, you'll notice that some of the compounds appear in, all, in, in many of the species, but not all. Some of them occur in every one. So it all depends upon the organism, the exposure level, whether they've, what they've consumed in their diet, and so on. But the fact is that, uh, these phthalates are present in uh, these organisms at uh, parts per billion level. And the question that comes up automatically is, gee, is this bad? And is this a significant level? Uh, this is kind of on the low side, uh, I would say, uh, much like the low side that we typically see for other types of contaminants in these species. When you start looking at uh, things like um, POPs, for example, Alaska tends to be relatively clean for many organisms. The main concern are organisms that are really high in the food chain that consume large masses of, uh, of other organisms. So for example, marine mammals like stellar sea lions, whales, and so forth would be 
uh, organisms that would have higher level. Now, the other side of this is that uh, for organisms that are uh, exposed here, if they metabolize, these phthalates would be pretty readily metabolized. At least that seems to be the evidence from animal studies. And then uh, the, the secondary compounds that are produced, these metabolites, uh, can also be a hazard as well because it turns out that some of those have been shown to be endocrine disruptors as well. But uh, I'll be quite honest, there's a huge number of questions to be addressed here and very little has been done. So there's lots of uh, research that could probably be attempted here. And then we looked at uh, other things, in particular the tufted puff instances showing crop and gizzards of these animals, and we saw different levels of, con of contamination, and many of the samples showed none. So it all depend upon what they were eating and whether they had plastics present in their tissue. So here's an example of a crop that actually had plastic particles, and this had a very high level that says that high one that you see there is somewhere around three or 400 parts per billion of these phthalates. So overall, this is an image showing the table of all the results that we got for the different edibles, the range of the concentrations that you see. Uh, and you'll notice that in many cases, they're, uh, for certain phthalates, it's lower than limit detection. Uh, in others, it's much higher. So you'll notice that the compounds that were present in appear to, what appear to be the highest concentrations are DBP and DEHP. And of course, DEHP cause, produces MEHP, which is also a known uh, endocrine disruptor. So anyway, the, it shows you that not all the phthalates are present because of the composition of the plastics. Those plastics that happen to have be, uh, those phthalates that tend to be the highest in, in presence of plastics that are here in Alaska are the DBP and DEHP. What's the significance of this in terms of, inter of environmental impact? Not really known with regards to marine organisms. So this shows you then where we collected the samples, just to show you roughly proxi prox rough proximity of where we got these samples. Coho salmon were in Valdez, uh, the halibut and the clams uh, came, and, uh, came mainly from the Cook Inlet region and, uh, and uh, Kachemek Bay. And then uh, the tuffet puffins came from the most remote of the Aleutian Islands. And that happened to be a biological study that was being done by uh, one of our faculty members here. And they were willing to, they actually were curious about uh, other contaminants like uh, POPs. And so they asked, well, could, what about these phthalates? Can, we, can you look at that as well? And so we did run some samples there and found that the tufted puffins do have uh, concentrations that uh, are fairly significant for certain compounds. It depends upon the plastics that are assimilated into the organism by their feeding. So anyway, it gives you an idea of, uh, of, uh, of concentrations at different locations for, uh, throughout South Central Alaska and uh, the Aleutian chain with regards to the tufted puffins. Obviously, when you think about Alaska, it's such a huge place. Uh, and almost, first of all, we don't even know how much of the plastics are distributed within the water column. Uh, so we don't have an idea of how fine the particle sizes are, any of that. It's all open to... Uh, uh, questions of analysis. We don't really have a whole lot of information. This is probably the first attempt to even look at these uh, compounds that are present in the plastics. Now the plastics themselves, how much is present in the tissues of, the, of fish species, how much gets assimilated into the cells, for example, when you start talking about concentrations of plastics are on the order of nanometers in size, there will be compound sizes where they could be assimilated directly into the cell. So that, all those things need to be somehow addressed or hopefully will be addressed at some point in the future. So our support for this came from uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and from NOAA, uh, which provided funding for this project and actually for some of the projects regarding the tufted puffins. Uh, National Science Foundation provided us with the uh, instrumentation. We we're fortunate to get a instrumentation grant for the LC Triple Quad Mass Spec. And the people who were involved in making this all happen were Sharina Lee, Ben Applegate, and Dr. Begator Hagedorn, who's uh, the asset lab manager and also a co-investigator with me. And uh, Doug Causey and his students provided the seabird samples, and they are with the UAA biology department. And of course, there's all kinds of references related to this, and anyone who's interested in that uh, is welcome to get this uh, presentation and to get some of these references as well. So with that, I think I will stop.
it's 10 of 1, so hopefully I haven't taken too much of your time for questions, but I'll be glad to answer any and all that you have. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kenish. And we do have uh, some questions that looks like appearing in the question box, so let me um, start with one here, and we'll see if any others uh, come in. So um, the question here says, when educating the public about microplastics, what buzzwords other than polyethylene could we advise ourselves and others as consumers to look for in products so that they do not contribute to the problem of microplastics? Wow, that's a good question. Part of the problem is um, are those things labeled onto the content of the material that you're purchasing? I suspect in many cases, for example, in uh, things that are integrated into um, detergents or uh, material that's used for cosmetics and so on, I seriously doubt it will even appear there. The question then is for us to actually make people aware that they are there for starters and that they are, the, and we need to make people aware that uh, there's the plastics that we commonly think of as, say, water bottles, uh, styrofoam, things like that are not the only issue. We also have to be concerned about uh, the really uh, diverse r array of particle size. So it's, it's, I actually admit this is a good question because somehow we have to come up with uh, buzzwords that will make people aware of not, that, that the problem is not just simply the material alone but also the particle sizes here. Uh, I don't really have a direct, clear answer for, for that at this point, but I think that's something that uh, people who are probably really working in the science of information transfer to the public might want to consider how to approach that. It's not one of my, <laughs> it's not really one of my uh, specialties, but I think that's a very, very, very important thing. That is to make people understand the nature of what uh, they're using and what the impacts are when it gets into the environment. Okay, thank you. I have another question here that says, are there published or generally accepted protocols for monitoring macro or microplastics in the ocean? They're all preliminary. Um, there were some presentations made at the Tacoma uh, workshop, uh, which uh, I don't, they were supposed to be pr uh, publishing the proceedings from that, which I think was supposed to include that in, uh, information, but I haven't seen it from the last workshop. So there have been several attempts to do that, and uh, they're not what you would call standard methods at this point, uh, because I think people are still being challenged by uh, clear characterization, uh, clear separation and characterization of materials. So I think that uh, is an area where there's uh, a, a lot of work still to be done, but there are a several. Uh, there are, have been several reports uh, on trying to do that. That is, collect the samples by just collecting the material. In fact, I just saw a report where in uh, Tacoma they collected the material by netting, uh, you know, basically tracking it behind a boat using a special uh, device to keep the, the uh, keep the net at a certain level and collecting the debris and which included a whole bunch of things, all kinds of material, you know, like uh, plant material and so on uh, that were suspended. But in amongst all that is this plastic as well. So you have, one has to oxidize the organic material and isolate the particles and then characterize those. Well, it turned out that University of Washington uh, also reported that there was uh, that the the way that samples are collected was uh, producing a result that was low relative to the amount that's uh, throughout the water column. So there's so there's lots of uh, lots of work to be done there. So once but it, but actually isolating the particles is a real challenge because one has to go through uh, and because first of all the particles range from as micro particles macro particles all the way down to nanoparticles and not the, the, the actual analytical methods to determine these is quite varied in itself. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's not something that you can do with just one instrument. So has to re it requires lots of steps. Yeah, thanks for that answer. I mean, I, this speaks partly to why, you know, some people have this impression that there's this 
continuous garbage patch, why don't we just go skim all the plastics <laughs> out of the ocean? And uh, it's clearly not not that easy to get these things out when they're at such small level. That's right. And then the other side of it is mixed, mixed with all that plastic, right, when you collect it, are a whole bunch of living organisms and, and uh, food for other organisms. And to be able to go out there and just simply do the skimming thing and collecting it and, and put it in the, into a... Uh, into a disposal zone area is kind of naive because you're also going to affect the uh, availability of food for many other organisms. It's it's a nightmare. It's a real nightmare because you've now integrated food sources with uh, these contaminants. Here's a question uh, that I think is probably on a lot of folks' minds. Um, are there any studies for background uh, or natural levels of these compounds, or are there even natural levels of these compounds? Oh no, phthalates, uh, all these are man-made, uh, phthalates are man-made, there is no natural source for these compounds. Unfortunately, like most of the contaminations that we see on the planet that everyone's concerned about, they're related to man-made products. So being a chemist, you know, uh, chemists are the only, uh, only people in science who actually make new materials. Unfortunately, uh, many of the things that we made have turned out to be uh, a bit of a disaster once they get into the environment, and uh, it's it's a, it's a kind of a sad sad statement of our inability to uh, recognize uh, the significance of potential impacts because we really don't know uh, the answers to the to the questions. In fact, the problem is maybe we don't ask the questions as to what the impacts are first so that it's a it's not a it's a it's kind of a as a chemist I have to admit it's a sad situation so unfortunately yes these are man-made compounds they're not natural and uh, they do interfere if you think about it for a while they're man-made and they interfere with these uh, natural systems like the endocrine system they bind to the proteins that are present there that are carried to the uh, into the cell to the gene to trigger the transcription process and uh, <coughs> it turns out there's a whole cascade of those events so when you talk about biochemistry of the cell which is a true of virtually every organism in, on the planet uh, these things have an impact and it turns out that if you think about the uh, biochemistry uh, study area you know everybody is familiar with the Krebs cycle right but there's many cycles and now we're just beginning to realize that there are also many cycles that have to do with the triggering in the in the uh, genetic uh, genetics of the cell. And only recently we realized that junk genes, for example, are where some of the triggering occurs. So it tells it just shows you that we're totally ignorant of uh, the impacts we're having on the planet because we're not even asking the right questions. Okay, I've got a couple more here. Um, how much impact do you think freshwater creeks, such as those in Anchorage? contribute to the plastic problem in the ocean? <laughs> oh, well, that's a good one. I suspect that I'm guessing from what my own experience of seeing it, it's relatively small compared to like that picture you saw in the one slide I had, which was from Asia, where there's all that plastic flowing out. I think the bigger impact in Anchorage would be the Point Lawrence off plant because of the uh, release of all the plastics that are integrated from detergent use and from all the uh, all the other materials that people use to wash when they take a shower, for example, you have you have all these various agents you use to to cleanse your body, and they also contain nanoparticles of plastics. They go right in the environment at that level. So, I, I, looking at the extremes here, I haven't seen a tremendous amount of debris flowing out, but I think. Uh, when you think about the volume of water coming through the Point Wurzel plant, it's massive. So yeah, I, I would think I would think that I think that would be a bigger concern as far as I would, you know to me. A recent article I saw um, was referring to all the microplastics that are released from our polyester fabrics and yes. synthetic mm -hmm. fabrics when we wash them. So uh, um, yeah, that water treatment system more of a source than we might think. Um, okay, yeah. here's one. Um, we, we talk about recycling plastics often. Are these plastics coming out of the ocean, they're absorbing other contaminants. Does that 
preclude recycling as a good option for those things? Are they too contaminated? <laughs> yeah, I'd say that, uh, well, I guess the question, it's like, here's the problem. It's concentration versus the impact. So you have to know what the chemicals are and, and from, the, from the previous knowledge of what kind of impacts they have in the environment would determine how you would deal with it. But in all likelihood, uh, it, it's not the same as taking a pure chemical and uh, essentially uh, recycling it like you would with distillation or, some, or something like that. Here you've got a whole myriad of compounds. In the end, you may end up only having the responsibility of actually burning it to re, uh, in a Class A a generator so that you can get rid of the material. I suspect that's probably the likelihood. And right now the question is what's going on with all of the dump sites throughout Alaska that are receiving this material. And that was one of the that was the first question I got with regards to these concern about these plastics when I was asked about this. And the right now no one is really addressing that. They're simply just taking it and, and putting it into landfills. And then the question is, are these landfills sealed, or, or are these contaminants going to get released eventually? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. OK, I have one more here. Um, I'll have uh, a couple more. One says, uh, are companies starting to become aware of the issue of microplastics, or do we need to target outreach to companies that could include microplastics in their products to make them aware so that they can come up with solutions? Oh, boy, that's a darn good one. In fact, that topic was on the public radio a little while ago, which and they were talking about there is a federal agency, I can't remember which one it is on the May head, who is supposed to be oversight, give oversight to nanomaterials, for example. So we can go, rather than talk about micro, let's go to nano levels. It turns out there's only recommendations. There's no regulatory uh, aspect to it. So these companies can do whatever they want. Uh, the question is, do they do the right thing by what they're producing. Uh, they certainly probably are with regards to their products for what it's intended to use. So the nanomaterials are used to get per enhance performance. And the question is, though, what's the significance of the, uh, the impact on the environment? That, that's, uh, that's really one that needs to be addressed. I mean, do they have social responsibility to be sure that they uh, minimize their impact on the environment? I don't have an answer for that. Those are, those are questions that the uh, Popular, public at large has to ask of them. Okay, thank you. And finally, uh, there's at least one uh, listener and probably more who would, is interested in getting your contact information. Is that something you can share? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. I'm, you can contact me at jmkenish, K-E-N-N-I-S-H, at uaa.alaska.edu. That's my, uh, it's, oh, it's there. You've got that already. On, uh, as the answer. And um, I do have a phone number as well. It's 907-786-1236. That's my office number, which also has an answering machine associated with it, or an answering system, I suppose. So anyone who would like to know more, contact me, or would like copies of this stuff, you're welcome to contact me at either the email address or by phone. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Kenish. And a reminder to others who are still listening that uh, this webinar will be archived and uh, available on the Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center's website. Give us a couple of days to turn that around, uh, www.oceanalaska.org. In fact, I say a couple of days. This point will probably be early next week when that's available. And uh, also, we have another webinar coming up. Our next one is scheduled for September 20th, so keep your ears to the ground for that one. It's going to be da Daniel Muse of the USGS speaking on past interglacial sea levels lessons for the future. So thanks to everybody for listening, and huge thanks to Dr. Kenish for sharing a, an hour of his time and expertise with us today. And on behalf of the Pacific Ocean Education team, um, thanks to everybody involved in the webinar. See you next time. Thank you.